going to have to ask the discussants to sort of keep themselves to uh, three minutes if they possibly can. Um, and so we'll go straight into um, Abe Pete from uh, the University of uh, Mumbai, um, who is going to respond. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Great to be here. If it's got to be three minutes, then I'm going to make pointed uh, things and no uh, scope of elaboration. The impression I get from the um, presentations made is one of Brownian motion. You had Ricky Burdett, who was very constructive and so on, uh, Professor Saskia Assassin, who uh, breathes in, I think, rarefied air and hits the ground very hard, and, and Professor Kundu, who comes from statistics and tries to generalize. So that's the kind of uh, overall sense I get from here. I think inclusion and livability are certainly the most important and crucial points. Uh, very importantly, what might be happening now in Mumbai is for the first time, NGOs or the civil society is going to become a force to reckon with. And that is very important. Uh, we are one point, I mean, since I don't have the time to discuss anything as far as uh, Professor Hickey Burdett talked about, I like two things about what he said. We just don't come and go. So I hope that there will be a greater engagement with the academic as well as the other institutions in terms of research and so on, because a lot is happening here. And despite your uh, intensive research for two years, perhaps not all has been covered here. He talked about housing. He just showed one graphic. I think uh, people here are completely aware of it. The problems are property rights not defined well, the stock and flows uh, disjoint that we have in terms of incomes and wealth, and the market rigidities in labor and land markets that we have. I think, uh, let me quickly point out a couple of things uh, as far as Professor Sassen was concerned. I think she turned around the uh, whole context. I mean, it's the globe in the city context, which is, I think, a very favorite theme that she has. The evolution of cities uh, is the best response articulating the capabilities that have been built up. And I have uh, complete uh, agreement with that. Cities are seen as crucial nodes of uh, supply chains, global supply chains. And she also talked about the new avatar of informalization, which, uh, of course, Professor Kundu talked about later. Just two points quickly about what she said, which I don't agree with. When she was talking about quality of life, I don't think corporate tax is a good uh, signal at all for uh, talking about a city. Um, that, and also, uh, the question of why is it that um, despite this, the city is not getting as much as it should. City is not getting as much as it should is true. However, by definition, I don't think taxes have the quid pro quo there. Uh, the idea is, the argument should be that the local bodies have to be given their due, which they are not being given currently, and also to argue that it is in the interest of the state and the central governments because of the buoyancies, if the cities do well, they are going to do well, that would be the prime driver for them to invest in cities. As far as Professor Kundu is concerned, uh, obviously the skewed growth pattern, though I don't share the concern with the uh, exclusionary urban growth in the sense that he talks about. I don't, I mean, I don't really um, share that as a concern. It might well be that that's the way things will happen. Uh, the fact that number of census towns going down and so on, and small and medium cities uh, not coming up or growing to the same extent as metros and large cities. But frankly, I'm not really concerned with this because there is no categorical imperative that you should have a uniform uh, distribution in growth patterns. Uh, he talked about 74th Constitutional Amendment. I think the 74th Constitutional Amendment does not go far enough. It is an afterthought uh, done by policymakers living in a country which still continues to believe that India lives in our villages. 
It does not empower, forget the ward committees, it does not empower the uh, local bodies to the extent that they should, either legislatively or provide them the, uh, providing them with a loving usage of capabilities that they already have. Uh, as far as the capital market access is concerned that he referred to, uh, and I know that he is not very fond of that, but the argument of people who pro propagate these kinds of ideas is not withdrawal of state at all. It is that delimitation and focusing on the other things which the state ought to do and should do, probably with more engagement than heretofore. And uh, it's just that people who can do should be doing uh, what... I think he made very important um, pertinent points about health, um, and I'm in total agreement with that. The, I'll conclude by his concern about sanitization, but at the cost of uh, sounding a reactionary, uh, I am reminded of Adam Smith when he said that, uh, you know, it is a folly to cure, though it might be prudent to relieve. Thank you. Because we'll have too many other people. I, I apologize for this rather <laughs> savage time restriction. You did, you did brilliantly well. And um, Mr. Parasaraman from the Tata Institute will do just as well. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. The, the slowing down of um, urban growth, I, I think it is happening um, uh, as a paradox in the sense that uh, the crisis in agriculture and the displacement of people from lands and livelihoods, uh, both due to industries and due to SEZ, I think is creating a condition of, of a greater push out of villages. I think that's, that's, that we can see uh, across the country. Now, still it doesn't translate into um, people moving on to the urban areas, and that is also in a context of um, you know, jobless uh, growth. Um, you, you have a context of jobless growth along with um, the displacement of people from uh, urban areas. I think um, Professor Sesson talked about the informalization and, 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 and the critical problems associated with this. I think you have a situation at this particular point in time. The rural push is happening along with the time the urban push out of um, the urban areas. So there, is a, there, there, there is that contradiction that one sees um, there. Um, Professor Sestan also talked about uh, the, the informalization is low cost. It is largely enacted on the backs of more vulnerable workers and the households, I think, in, in, in urban context as such. I think one of the, um, one of the most um, important um, aspect which you see in urban context is um, the lack of compassion. The lack of compassion within the society for people who are disempowered and, and poor. I think um, the desire to make poor invisible um, is, 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 is part of this particular process whereby the uh, informalization of labor along with um, 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 you know, displacement you want the poor people to work in the urban areas, but you don't want them um, to be living closer to you, to, 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 be, to be part of your system. I think this is a greater uh, problem um, in it. The time of the logic of globalization, the economic globalization per se, that has begun to structure all aspects of human life. Um, it, you can see it in every aspect of uh, urban life uh, as such, whether it is in terms of um, access to health care, whether in terms of access to affordable housing in, 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 in urban areas. I think this is where the greatest problem um, you find. One talked about the statistics relating to poverty. It's possible to earn $2 per day, but then the, the cost of health care is so great in a context where there is deteriorating um, um, uh, urban environment for poor people to live in, you might earn $2 but the cost of healthcare, the cost of education, the cost of water for poor people is so great that it doesn't really make um, um, a greater sense. I think the difference between um, above poverty line and, and you know, the depth you can hit um, is so great in this country and, and particularly in, in, in urban areas as such. The retreat of the state. 
I think it is a, it's a very important phenomenon, both in our rural areas and in urban areas. Um, we need to look at um, what's happening to, um, uh, to, to, to slum context in Mumbai, slum context in uh, other parts of the country, that, um, that there, is, there is a gradual withdrawal of the state in many aspects of life of the poor people. And, um, and, I, and, and poor people depend more on state. I think um, the, 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 the protection of their rights to health care, rights to education, um, and, and, and securing freedoms can, can result mostly from the state uh, support. But I think um, it is in poor people's life in urban areas that the state has retreated to a greater extent. And that's an that's a enormously worrying point um, in, in our context. Um, I think these are, these are some of the uh, critical points that came up. I can, I, there are many other issues which people will be bringing up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Pasharaman. Could I ask Lindsay Bremner to, uh, from Temple University? Thank you. Um, I'm going to respond to just one point that Saskia made with a few brief remarks. Um, and that is the point about how globalization is wired into urban spaces um, in ways that are quite specific to those spaces and their history. And I'd like to do this by looking for a moment at the economic histories of two places, one I'm very familiar with, Johannesburg, and one I'm not very familiar with, Mumbai. Um, Johannesburg's economy was a mining economy requiring vast reserves of capital and labor to entice the earth to spit out its wealth. These conditions have produced a centralized, quantifiable city on top of underground conurbations whose function was to transform people into machines and sap from them their vital entrepreneurial energies. These two characteristic spaces of the modern mechanical metropolis, the vertical shaft and the underground stope, have been increasingly <coughs> disconnected by the entrepreneurial, flexible logics of contemporary urbanization. And because of this, producing a fragmented city of ruins and frontiers. Mumbai's economy, on the other hand, was a textile economy producing a city whose architecture is an aggregation of human bodies, a continuous horizontal network, a flexible fabric. I think it's a kind of biotechnical environment, closer to an agricultural system, linked to seasons, cycles, weather, and the reversibility of crops, more to the paradigm of urban government. This foresaw, I think, the electronic thought of a web-based society where everything is associated and interconnected and explains why this city has leapfrogged over the clunky mechanical modernity for an era of fuzzy logics, mass entrepreneurship, and elastic modernity. And this brings me to what I'd like to say to propose as a characteristic description of Mumbai's performance in global processes, and that's its elasticity, its ability to stretch without tearing, to not break at the seams, to expand and contract, to be pushed and pulled, to stretch around the globe and back again. Um, flying here, I was um, sat with a young man from Mumbai who has worked for years as a ticket salesman at Euston Station in central London. With his earnings, he has bought an apartment in, in Mumbai where his family now live. He visits them twice a year. He only plans to live like this until he decides to look for a wife, as he put it, when he will return to Mumbai to marry and raise a family. I'm sure this is a fairly typical story but one which talks of the extent to which Mumbai cannot be confused with a single geographic location. I think Mumbai is everywhere. It's a lycra city. It's only Mumbai, insofar as it maintains its capacity to elastically extend and contract between London, Sydney, Toronto, and California. 
And finally, I'd like to talk about a weak urbanization. As I've listened to discussions about India's urbanization over the last day only, I must confess, what has struck me is how inflexibly the categories of urban and rural, of city and village, are used to think about Mumbai. It seems to me there might be a better way to think about this city, as part of, not separate from its territory, for who can tell where Mumbai begins and ends? Instead, I think a concept of weak urbanization more accurately imagines the situation, one in which an agricultural landscape <coughs> survives in the presence of evolved but no longer totalizing urban infrastructures and services. A city conceptualized as a field, irrigated by urban services, in an innovative mediation, a world no longer codified as urban or rural, city or village, but rather a sum of physical and virtual places that respond to different organizational logics that penetrate and qualify one another. In other words, a concept which I think will allow us to think and plan differently. Thank you. Could I request uh, Professor Dieter Leffler, uh, Professor of Regional Urban Economics, Hafen City University, Hamburg, to make his comments? Sure. Yes, uh, not being uh, an expert on Mumbai, I will anyhow take the risk to place Mumbai in, in the range of our global city, since we have already discussed. So, with London and New York, it was evident. This has been the comeback cities with a very dynamic demographic and economic uh, development. The same was with Shanghai, with enormous dynamic of economic and uh, population growth. Berlin and Johannesburg, they suffer from a specific transition I won't discuss now, but uh, Mexico was a very specific case. In Mexico, we had a strongly expand, or not strongly, but still expanding city in a demo demo demographic way, but a shrinking city in an economic way. And now Mumbai, despite the slowing down of the rural urban migration, it's still growing in a demographic way. In Mumbai, we see an important shift to a knowledge, in, <coughs> knowledge economy, as Saskia has shown. But what's it's very important with, with, with Mumbai that if we look in the last 10 years, we have a strong decrease in formal employment. And we have a strong increase of informal employment, casual employment, self-employment. And this gives an enormous pressure on the government to react more or less as an employment system, not as a decision system, which reinforces again the pressure of retreat of the, of the state, which reinforces again this problem of unemployment. So what, what we see is this very complicated interaction between globalization, informalization, urbanization, and the more liberal regime of politics. And this leads to a strong segmentation, fragmentation, exclusion. And uh, well, when, when, now, I think there's a key point now. How, how judge we the informal economy? And I think Saskia will, 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 will agree that what we see in Dharavi or what we see alongside the water side is not the new informal economy. But it's a degraded form of strategies of surviving by a strong form, we will discuss later, by a strong form of, of, of exclusion. So if this is right, there are still, as you know, as you said, I, I'm, I, I'm convinced there are still forms of this new informal economy you can find. But it, the question is what is the majority of these informal activities? And I think there's this, this your, your notion of formal, informal uh, sector is, is a very interesting interface between the two systems. But if my, 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 my sketch is right, so we cannot hope that there will be a solution of this exclusion, of this uh, segregation, by focusing on the global city strategy. But we have to discuss how we can build bridges from this 
informal economy to the formal economy. So sanitary education will be key issues. But we also have to rediscuss manufacturing. For, you know, we have this big problem of this uh, breaking down of the manufacturing without uh, upgrading and transforming of the manufacturing. So we have to discuss the notion, also discuss the new urban manufacturing or other forms of manufacturing. So this, I think, we, we, we open up new perspectives we haven't discussed in the other urban, our other urban age cities. And I think it's a very, very interesting case study we should take serious in its specificity and its very specific dynamics, which are strongly reinforced by globalization, but also strongly determined by the history and the specific context. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Rakesh, a, a last word? Yes, sir. I think that we've had a really uh, very, very interesting discussion, which just illustrates how we are in the midst of uh, transition to uh, higher economic growth. Um, and I think that the comments have illustrated some of the fears. But what I would say is that it's imperative that we, make, we accelerate urbanization. And I think uh, the point made by Professor Lepley on um, manufacturing, that in India we normally almost never talk about manufacturing in connection with urbanization, very different from other cities. We seem to be afraid of manufacturing in our cities, but in fact it's really manufacturing bringing manufacturing into the middle of cities uh, with people employed in those uh, jobs is going to make a difference. So we really have to approach this transition of faster urbanization, faster economic growth with confidence rather than fear. And I think that is what Mr. Patak uh, illustrated. I didn't detect any fear in him in what he's doing in Mumbai. And all power to you, Mr. Patak, for going on con with, with, with the confidence. We have to make our cities, however, much more people friendly in India than they currently are. It is just not comfortable living in our cities today. And we have to make them comfortable and therefore people should be happy to come into the city because they're going to get jobs and be comfortable. Thank you very much. Thank you. The uh, three main speakers and the four discussants all succeeded admirably in giving us a lot of food for thought in that session. They reacted to each other brilliantly.